Don't fret. Your entire life is in front of you, a frequently uttered saying to adolescents. This was precisely what Anna Kriegel, a 14-year-old student residing in Ireland, repeatedly heard. And nobody could have foreseen the terrifying incidents that unfolded on a regular day in May 2018. Geraldine and Patrick Kriegel resided in Ireland. By 2006, they had celebrated their 20th wedding anniversary. This couple was deeply connected, sharing a dream of welcoming a child into their lives. Aware of the extensive and time-consuming nature of the adoption procedure and the stringent requirements for prospective parents, they remained hopeful. The Kriegels inhabited a spacious residence in the serene, verdant suburb of Lixlip, situated in County Kildare's northeast. Paris, France, was Patrick's birthplace. He was involved in educating students in commercial and business-related French at the Dublin Institute of Technology. Geraldine held a senior management position in the legal department of a government-operated public transportation entity. Both partners enjoyed successful careers, had the financial stability, and harbored a profound desire to nurture a child, eagerly anticipating the arrival of their firstborn. Their patient wait was rewarded with the exhilarating news of a two-year-old girl from Russia, ready for adoption. Anastasia Kriegel, born on February 18, 2004, in Novokuznetsk, was placed in an orphanage shortly after birth due to her biological mother's inability to provide proper care. Spending her early years mostly in solitude as caregivers focused on more demanding children. This led to initial deficits in social and emotional development. The Kriegels were overjoyed at the prospect of meeting their daughter. It was an instant bond. August 10, 2006, marked their adoption's formalization, a day celebrated as a significant family milestone. They chose to retain her original name, affectionately nicknaming her Anna. The arrival of Anna's laughter in their house marked the most joyful day for Geraldine and Patrick. Eager to connect her with her roots, they presented her with a traditional Russian matryoshka doll, containing an image of young Anastasia inside. As she matured, Anna established and kept up connections with her younger siblings, including a newly added younger brother named Aaron. The tranquil existence of the couple evolved into an exhilarating journey. Anna became her father's darling and her mother's cherished princess. The parents dedicated themselves to providing their offspring with the finest experiences, sharing numerous activities like ice skating, skiing, playful times, and planning family excursions. Every summer, the Kriegel clan vacationed in Annecy, France, Patrick's native land, where they owned a residence and Anna forged numerous friendships. This yearly holiday was eagerly anticipated by Anna, who cherished her father's birthplace and took pride in learning French. However, Anna's life was not without its challenges. She had difficulties mastering English, which her mother assisted her with, striving to ensure her daughter could communicate smoothly with her peers. Additionally, Anna faced issues with forming attachments and expressing emotions. Her time in the orphanage, characterized by a lack of affection and prolonged periods in her crib, left her unaccustomed to physical touch. Nonetheless, Geraldine and Patrick bridged this emotional void, offering unwavering support and love. Their nurturing environment, enriched with educational activities, healthy eating and physical exercise, laid a robust foundation for Anna's future. Physical health concerns also emerged for the Kriegel's daughter. During a standard health checkup, a doctor detected a tumor in Anna's right ear. Surgery to remove it, lasting five and a half hours, resulted in her near total hearing loss in the affected ear and partial vision loss in the corresponding eye. Despite these setbacks, Anna grew into a lively and spirited youngster. Her hearing and vision impairments significantly hindered her academic progress, particularly in memorizing terms, leading to poor school performance through primary education. She engaged in specialist consultations until the eighth grade to keep pace with her peers. Middle school presented further challenges due to her sensitive disposition and distinctive personality traits. Being loud, at times disagreeable, and overly enthusiastic, Traits more common in younger children yet pronounced in Anna due to her maturity. To support Anna in navigating these difficulties, 
Geraldine and Patrick encouraged her participation in swimming and later dance, where she found joy and even performed at local events with a group. Despite her apprehensions about middle school, where the quest for acceptance among peers was daunting, Anna yearned to make new friends, confronting the harsh reality of teenage cruelty towards those perceived as different. Classmates somehow found out that the girl was adopted and they started to tease her, calling Geraldine and Patrick fake parents. Unable to make friends at school, Anna felt rejected and began to spend even more time on the internet. She had profiles on several social networks and her own YouTube channel. On one hand, being online opened up a whole new world, but on the other, there were people hiding behind fake accounts whose goal was to ruin others' lives because they were nothing themselves. Anna, like many teenagers, was very impressionable and took all the negative comments to heart. This further destroyed her self-esteem and led to her wanting even less to stay in this world. The fact was that the girl grew much faster than most of her peers and noticeably stood out from the crowd. By the age of 13, her height was almost 5 feet 9.69 inches, which was not surprising since Anna was a native Siberian. But in Ireland, this only gave a reason for insults. From the outside, she looked quite mature, and there were many comments of an intimate nature about her on the internet. But the girl was only 13 years old. She was naive, and this only brought her another disappointment in life. Anna told her mother what was happening. Geraldine, far from virtual life, tried to protect her daughter from the negativity and sought help from the school principal. She expressed concern that her daughter was being bullied, but how could an educator influence anonymous online users? And this only worsened Anna's situation because rumors spread that her parents were worried about her. Soon, classmates found all her profiles on social networks, which led to even more negativity. One day, the girl was walking home alone, enjoying long walks in her favorite blue headphones, when unexpectedly four young men blocked her way. They mocked her, making unambiguous hints, and one even pinched her ass. Anna looked like an adult woman, but inside she was still an innocent child. She was scared, ran home in tears, and told her mother everything. Geraldine and Patrick took the incident seriously and filed a complaint against the young men. The parents told officers about the person who inappropriately touched Anna, but he was just given a warning. No charges were filed. The mother and father decided to drive their daughter to school and escort her to classes every day. However, this was not normal for a teenager and only led to a new wave of ridicule against her. It got to the point where Anna drew a bruise under her eye and came to school in such a state. It was a cry for attention. The girl depicted how she felt inside, bruised, broken, and hurt, and she wanted to show this to others. She created several fake accounts and started leaving offensive comments under her own photos and posts on social networks. Perhaps in this way, Anna wanted to get closer to her peers, to do the same as they did, laugh at herself. Every alteration profoundly affected Geraldine. Witnessing her gentle daughter in such distress was painful. The root causes were manifold, as Anna turned to physical methods to escape her emotional turmoil, inflicting damage on herself. The parents sounded the alarm, apprehensive their child might take more drastic actions. They sought help from an organization that specialized in guiding teenagers through evolving and challenging scenarios. But there, Anna's issues were considered too severe, beyond their scope, leading her to a charitable group dedicated to aiding individuals at risk of self-injury. The girl participated in these meetings weekly, yet still departed school solitary, eyes cast downward, headphones in, while her peers exited in lively, chattering groups. This reality weighed heavily on Geraldine. She deeply empathized with her daughter. Concealing her tears of desperation, her sole wish was for her daughter's happiness. At last, personal therapy started to show promise, with the girl forming a few intimate friendships, enjoying sleepovers, strolls, movie nights, and confiding in them about boys. Anna's initial year of middle school was nearing its conclusion. On the sunny afternoon of Sunday, May 13, 2018, Geraldine intended to assist her daughter with test preparations. They typically reviewed together, particularly on weekends, and despite her demanding job, 
Geraldine always managed to allocate time for Anna's academic needs. However, they opted for relaxation, turning on the TV, preparing popcorn, and cuddling on the sofa for a movie, later enjoying a family event. Anna's cherished cousins were all present. Geraldine ordered pizza for the group, the children engaged in games, while the adults savored wine and appetizers, creating a joyful atmosphere. Yet, unbeknownst to Anna's relatives, this evening would mark the last of such gatherings. On the morning of May 14th, 2018, the day started off as it typically did. Geraldine caught a train heading to Dublin, and Anna set off for her school day. Later in the afternoon, she was scheduled to see a psychologist, and Patrick, now enjoying his retirement, took advantage of a leisurely morning to sleep in. Once her classes were concluded by 4 p.m., Anna attempted to contact her mother, who was unable to respond due to being engaged in an important business meeting. Geraldine responded via text, promising to return the call at her earliest convenience. Meanwhile, Patrick was enjoying the sunshine in the garden when he heard the doorbell. Greeting him at the door was a young man, around the same age as Anna. The sight was unexpected. The girl seemed taken aback by the visitor. Although they knew each other, Patrick had never witnessed them spending time together before. Anna's excitement was evident. She whispered briefly to the visitor, snatched up her beloved black hooded sweatshirt, and informed her dad she'd be back shortly. Before rushing off, Patrick reminded her of her study obligations, which she dismissed, caught up in the moment. He watched them head toward the much-frequented St. Catherine's Park, marking the last moment he saw his daughter. Patrick was initially unworried, considering the park's close proximity, just a 20-minute stroll away, and its popularity among kids Anna's age. The park, covering an area of 80 hectares, boasts woodlands, picturesque fields, spots for picnicking, and play areas. It's a common site for dog walkers, sports enthusiasts, and hosts various events, remaining open to visitors until 6 p.m. as indicated at its entrance. By 5.10 p.m., Geraldine was leaving for home and tried calling Anna, receiving no response. Assuming she would be back soon, she refrained from calling again. Yet, upon her return, Anna was nowhere to be found. Patrick relayed to his wife that Anna had gone to the park with a young man, an odd occurrence given Anna's struggles to connect with peers, and now a boy had approached her for a walk. The mother immediately texted her daughter, urging her return. Given Anna's constant attachment to her phone, her silence was alarming. Mrs. Kriegel, always overly cautious due to Anna's past experiences with bullying and her medical conditions, and recent troubles with young men, sent a stern warning in her next message, threatening to involve the police if she didn't hear back. The message aimed to express her deep concern, yet Anna remained silent. Overwhelmed with concern, Geraldine ventured into the park, noticing families and dog walkers but no trace of Anna. The parents, driven by anxiety over their daughter's unusual silence, scoured various streets by car, desperate for any sign of her. Their worry deepened given the constant communication they typically maintained with Anna. Adding to their distress was their lack of knowledge about the young man Anna had last been seen with. Upon returning home without any leads, they delved into online searches for any connections to Anna's school peers or friends that might resemble the boy, but to no avail. As the night wore on, reaching 9 p.m., four hours after Anna's departure, the Kriegels, acknowledging their daughter's minor status, reported her as missing to the police, emphasizing her unusual lack of communication and the mysterious young man's invitation. The police swiftly identified and located the boy, referred to here as Bray for privacy. Bray and his family were taken aback by the police's late visit, during which they inquired about the specifics of his and Anna's separation that day. Bray recounted their walk in the park, noting that they had parted ways around 5.40 p.m. Following Bray's account, the police initiated an official search for Anastasia Kriegel, canvassing the area and reviewing surveillance footage for clues. Geraldine and Patrick distributed photos of Anna, particularly one featuring the black hoodie she wore when last seen. The community rallied around the distraught parents, aiding in a thorough search effort. Meanwhile, 
the police scrutinized video evidence showing Anna and Bray together in St. Catherine's Park around 5 p.m. and exiting near another park entrance at 5.14 p.m. However, mere minutes after their departure from the park and following an unanswered message from her mother, Anna vanished without a trace. The mystery deepened with Bray's return home absent Anna, prompting questions about the events that transpired after their last sighting together. The investigation took a critical turn with the discovery of a witness who had observed the teenagers walking towards Blake Avenue, appearing jovial. Surveillance footage later showed Bray traversing the park alone at 5.49 p.m. Under scrutiny, Bray revealed the involvement of another friend, Arun, in their plans. Arun and Bray had a connection to Anna, with one being the object of her affection and the other playing the role of a facilitator for their outside-the-park rendezvous. Armed with this new information, the police escalated their efforts, broadcasting the search for Anna extensively across community networks, digital platforms, and local media by the evening of May 15th, while also making a concerted push to identify Arun. Arun, identifiable by his backpack, was captured entering and later exiting the park's vicinity, marking his absence for a significant period. With two teenage witnesses now part of the narrative, the police were keen on corroborating their accounts to piece together the events of that day. As the community's concern grew, the police were inundated with sightings of Anna from various locations, adding layers of complexity to the search. Amidst these reports, a tip suggesting Anna might have eloped was briefly considered, but ultimately deemed implausible. In an attempt to unravel the mystery, detectives organized a park walkthrough with Bray and Arun under the watchful eyes of their parents. Their interaction during this exercise raised suspicions, prompting the police to separate them for detailed questioning at the station. Bray's account was consistent with his earlier statement. However, Arun's story differed. He was surprised when his friend brought Anna along, knowing she had a crush on him, but he had no feelings for her. When Kriegel invited him on a date, he expressed his disinterest, and eventually she left looking sad and annoyed and his friend had also disappeared by then. On his way home, Arun was attacked by two strange men, leading to a fight during which he managed to hit one on the head, and both men ran off. He even showed the sergeant injuries he had sustained, including marks on his arm and leg and a cut on his face. These men could be responsible for Anna's abduction, so the detectives needed their full description. They also took the boy's belongings for forensic analysis, hoping to find DNA of the assailants. As the probe advanced at an accelerated pace, law enforcement called in specialized search units, including divers to scrutinize adjacent aquatic areas and a team of rescuers. With a total of 60 individuals involved, alongside volunteers and all relatives of the Kriegel family, the vanishing of Anna turned into the leading news event throughout Ireland. Her image wearing a hoodie became emblematic of her case. Adjacent to St. Catherine's Park lay Glenwood, a forsaken farmhouse. Following a report from an onlooker about spotting a youth heading that way, the authorities opted to inspect the premises. In 2018, Glenwood was a rundown rural mansion, originally a double-story dwelling located on a 42-hectare farmstead constructed in the 19th century. Previously regarded as a magnificent property, it had turned into a frequented gathering place for youths. The mansion was in decay, with a section of its roof caved in and overrun with rubble. The reason for law enforcement's delayed focus on this site remained uncertain. On Thursday, May 17th, detectives undertook an extensive search of the property, initiating from the farmhouse and progressively covering the fields. Search squads began at St. Catherine's Park, meticulously inspecting each trench on their way to the abandoned edifice. A number of experts searched the ancillary structures at Glenwood, while others proceeded to the main dwelling. Inside was profoundly dark. Scarcely any light made it through the boarded-up apertures. In the initial chamber, cluttered with debris and waste, a figure on the ground was initially mistaken for a dummy by a policeman, who was then struck by a pungent odor filling the space. As his vision adapted to the gloom, he realized it was the nude body of a woman. Littered around were fragments of apparel and a shattered cell phone. 
The area was splattered with blood, and close by was a brick and a hefty stick. Identified by the garments, it was Anastasia Kriegel. Her corpse exhibited numerous wounds with a strip of insulating tape tightly wrapped around her neck. Underneath the tape, three of her fingers were positioned as though she had attempted to remove it herself. It was evident she had valiantly struggled for her life, now amidst refuse and shattered glass bottles, lifelessly bare except for black socks. Instantly, myriad inquiries emerged regarding how such a calamity could strike an innocent young girl, the identity of the perpetrator, why Anna was in that vicinity, and if the boys had witnessed her being assaulted. The most challenging aspect was to convey to the parents that they would never again experience their daughter's laughter or witness her smile, nor would they be fetching her from school anymore. No parent was ever ready for such devastating news. This irrevocably altered the existence of Geraldine and Patrick. The loss of their much-awaited, deeply cherished Anna represented an indescribable tragedy. The details of the tragedy quickly became known to the entire small community, shocking most people. Glenwood House, located near St. Catherine's Park, a place where children peacefully played and where nothing like this had ever happened before, was now the scene of a grim discovery. Overwhelmed by grief, Geraldine and Patrick asked for one thing, privacy. They wanted to do everything possible to shield their younger son, Aaron, from the news. On May 18, 2018, Anastasia Kriegel was buried. Hundreds of people attended her funeral, wearing red and white armbands in honor of the girl. A whole new world from Disney played in the background because Anna loved Disney. A miniature Eiffel Tower was placed in her coffin to honor her love for her father's homeland, France, and atop it, a Russian flag was placed. The last item Geraldine and Patrick placed with Anna was a Russian matryoshka doll, a nod to the country where she was born. The autopsy revealed the girl had suffered over 50 injuries, with bruises and cuts all over her body, particularly on her face, head, and neck. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head and strangulation. Forensic evidence showed that Anna had been assaulted, indicated by traces of semen found on her body. It was unclear whether she was alive or conscious during the assault. Kriegel's death occurred between 5.25 p.m. and 5.40 p.m., just minutes after she parted ways with the boys. Upon entering the room, she was struck with a heavy stick with nails protruding from both ends, followed by several blows from a broken brick. Blood spatter on the walls of the room, and evidence suggested her attacker dragged Anna towards the window, likely to get more light. After examining all evidence, the police made two arrests on May 24th. The community was shaken by the shockwave. Two teenagers, Bray and Aaron, last seen with Anna, were suspects in the young girl's death. Found in Aaron's backpack were a homemade zombie mask with Anna's blood, black gloves, shin guards, and knee pads. His DNA in the form of semen matched, and her blood was also found on his shoes and clothing. However, his mother, believing the story of an attack by two men, washed all his clothes. Arun's phone revealed a disturbing search history that included questions about torturing and humiliating women, along with a gallery of indecent images. The Children Act in Ireland provides several forms of safeguarding for young offenders, including ensuring their anonymity by transporting them to court appearances in vehicles without identification. Officials are convinced that keeping the identities of juvenile offenders confidential is essential for their future prospects, no matter the severity of the offense. Interrogations took place with the boy's parents present. Arun firmly rejected any participation in Anna's demise, in spite of clear evidence. The DNA from the other boy was not found at the scene of the crime, and his possessions were free of any blood. During interrogation, he confessed to witnessing Anna going into the Glenwood residence with Arun, but claimed ignorance of his friend's motives. Bray became curious about the dilapidated house until he was alarmed by screams. Upon entering, he saw Arun ripping apart Anna's clothing and attacking her, then turning to Bray with a look of void and menace, prompting Bray to simply walk away. Bray's remorse stemmed from his silence about the assault, as Anna's fate was essentially in his control. It later emerged that Arun had previously shared nefarious schemes with Bray, 
even naming the intended victim, hinting at their joint guilt. The release of both boys on bail pending their court date sparked public fury, not just for their opportunity to spend the summer with their kin, but also due to their shielded identities. Yet, the Irish legal system argued that in taking such measures, they were offering these youths a chance for redemption and rehabilitative prospects. Anyone trying to unveil their anonymity would be subject to legal action. Both boys came from respectable homes, were successful academically, and had no history of prior incidents or psychological problems, which profoundly astonished the community. The proceedings commenced on April 30th, 2019. During the entire duration of the trial, which was not open to the general public, the boys were permitted to have their parents by their side. Geraldine and Patrick Kriegel were present throughout the trial, enduring the recounting of the dreadful events. Despite the difficulty, they were determined to support Anna to the very end, bearing the agony of their daughter's ordeal alongside her. The narrative put forth by the prosecution suggested that Bray deceived Anna into leaving her home under the guise of meeting with Arun, whom she adored. The young man led her to Glenwood House, where the assault occurred. Remarkably, the accused were removed from the courtroom during the presentation of the post-mortem findings by the examiner to shield their young minds from further trauma. The length of the trial was extended for the comfort of the accused, while their legal representatives pointed to a dispute between Anna and Arun as a potential cause. Deliberations by the jury started on June 12, 2019, and five days later, they delivered their judgment. Arun was sentenced to life imprisonment, with the possibility of a review after 12 years due to his minor status at the time of the offense. Bray was found culpable for Anna Kriegel's death, despite the absence of direct physical proof of his involvement and received a 15-year sentence, with a review set for eight years hence. By law, their identities are to be kept confidential, with provisions for new identities upon their release. The tragic story of Anna Kriegel's life and harsh ending received worldwide attention. While efforts were made to protect the identities of the two youths, several instances of their identities being disclosed online occurred. This led to public outcry against the perceived protection of criminals by the system. Over 10 individuals faced consequences for sharing images or the actual names of the boys in breach of Ireland's legislation protecting minors. Yet, the most profound sentence was endured by Anna's adoptive parents. As Geraldine expressed, life without Anna ceased to be life at all. Patrick Kriegel passed away on June 19, 2022, haunted by regret over his decision to let his daughter leave with an unfamiliar boy that day. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.